Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dune class. Um, uh, before I jump in, I wanted to make sure to... S I had a, a, an announcement I wanted to start with, something I wanted to uh, to sort of tell you guys about and, and ask you about. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, um, we at Mythgard have uh, met some of the awesome people who are in the process of forming the new Museum of Science Fiction. If you're a science fiction fan and you haven't heard of this, um, you should totally look it up because it looks absolutely incredible. Uh, so they're they're going to build a new uh, a new museum dedicated to science fiction in Washington D.C. Um, it's not built yet; they're in the process of getting things together. But that means that you can actually uh, 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 let them, you, know, you can participate in letting them know what kind of exhibits you would like to see at such a museum. So, assuming that you're kind of interested in science fiction, being that you're attending a live class on Dune, um, and that you might want to do that, I just wanted to direct your attention to it. If you go to the MythGuard homepage, uh, the MythGuard.org homepage, you can see our announcement um, about that. Down at the bottom, at, at, at the bottom of our page, you can see a link to the post uh, where we give the uh, the link. I can also uh, paste it here. I'll paste it to you. For those of you who are here live, you can see it um, uh, in your chat window there. Um, so you can go and you can find that. And that um, that post contains the link to their survey where you can fill out their exhibit survey. Um, so I definitely uh, uh, suggest that you check that out. So it's uh, it's really pretty exciting stuff. So uh, uh, we are we are certainly big fans of the of the upcoming museum. Uh, it should be really neat. Um, anyway. Um, just wanted to just wanted to make sure to, to kind of bring uh, uh, bring that to uh, to everybody's attention. I want to uh, come back to the stuff that we were doing at the end of class last time, in particular, uh, looking at the question of Paul's terrible purpose um, and uh, and the the purposes of the Bene Gesserit that we were seeing through, especially through the conversation between the Reverend Mother and Jessica. Um, and and I want I want to I want to look a little bit more carefully because I you know I started to run out of time and kind of started skipping over things pretty quickly there at the end uh, of class last time. Um, but I I want to look a little more closely at the well the intersection maybe between this terrible purpose that Paul is feeling and the Bene Gesserit purpose. There seems to be a kind of common ground, right? Um, that is in the Quisatz Haderach, the whole you know, the, 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 the breeding program of the Bene Gesserit, right? They're trying to create the Kwisatz Haderach. They're trying to, to find the Kwisatz Haderach. Paul feels like he has a terrible purpose uh, laid upon him. And, uh, and of course, the, you know, the, the very opening thing that we get uh, in this book is the discussion between the Reverend Mother and Jessica in which the possibility of his being the Kwisatz Haderach is raised. So it's not like... You know, it's not put pretty clearly on our radar screen at the beginning, and it doesn't take too much to kind of connect the dots. So I think the question we're invited to ask, um, or I guess really it's kind of a, a, a set of questions, is, is Paul the Quisatz Haderach? And if so, what exactly does that mean? And is that his terrible purpose? And does that make him a tool of the of the Bene Gesserits? Right? That's one of the questions. I, I realized after class last time that I never made any comment about the title that I assigned to the lecture. Um, I titled the lecture last time, The Hand That Had Known Pain, um, for two reasons. One, because I, I, I just love that phrase, uh, you know, when Paul pulls his hand out of the pain box, you know, uh, after the Gom Jabbar, um, and uh, the reference that Herbert makes to that, to, you know, he, he looked down at the hand that had known pain, and I found that, uh, I found that that phrase really, really striking, but it seemed to me to be sort of a particularly evocative in the context of this whole passage and of these larger questions. Is Paul a tool, as Michael Chistovsky says, a tool like Ender, right? I mean, we looked at that in Ender's game. Is he is is he a tool in that way? Is is he merely, you know, the an appendage? You know, is is he like a hand that's being manipulated? Um, we see people. You know, we see like the 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 machinations of the Harkonnens and the way in which people are being used as cat's paws. Um, you know, we have this sort of three-way. You know, well, we, there's this there's this. You know, we we talk about the political. We we read about the political balance in the society, right, between the, the, the houses of the Landsfraud on the one hand and the Emperor on the other hand, and you know, Chome and the Spacing Guild and all these things, um, and. Uh, you know, so we, we, we already have this 
situation where people are manipulating others and each one seeking to 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 to, to bring about the the purpose the end that they have in mind um, we see more specifically then with the Atreides versus Harkonnen and of course we've got the Emperor in here too and it seems relatively clear that both Baron Harkonnen and the Emperor are like using each other as cat's paws right the Emperor wants to get rid of Leto because he's too close to the royal line the Emperor clearly sees him as a threat and so he is going to lend his Sardaukar uh, to the Harkonnen so that they can get rid of the Atreides for him he's gonna use Baron Harkonnen as his cat's paw but at the same time here's Baron Harkonnen saying I'm gonna use the Emperor as my cat's paw right in order to accomplish my own ends and then in the meantime you have you know the Atreides with of course a quite different point of view on the whole thing um, so you know and them sort of thinking about the Fremen right and you know think, thinking you know and and it's one thing that we got during the second reading is a little bit more about the relationship between the Fremen and and uh, and Duke Lido right um, and the way in which he is wanting to befriend them but also to use them um, that question remember that that really sensitive question about those bases right those secret bases which we're told are really really important to the Fremen but the Duke is really pushing at that, right? He wants them, you just to, you know, to take them for 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 um, for raw materials, even at the risk potentially um, of um, of of um, you know of of alienating the Fremen, and and so you know the question is at least raised. Even Paul sort of seems to have it in his mind uh, during that meeting. Um, to what extent is he simply using the Fremen, right? It is to what extent is he wanting to befriend them, and to what extent is he wanting to use them? Anyway, so this issue is my point is just we see this issue coming coming up all over the place, and it seems to me one of the crucial questions that is presented to us: the fact that he reveals so much at the very beginning. I mean, other authors might you know want to hold on to the whole Kriyat Tatarak thing, right? Um, might want to. Uh, and this is quite common, of course. The, the the idea of having a protagonist who is this, you know, foundling who turns out to be a king or this sort of like destined messiah figure. It's not like those kinds of stories are unheard of, right? Um, and there are lots of different ways of handling that kind of motif within your story. Herbert, very strikingly, like lays everything on the table at the very beginning, almost everything on the table at the very beginning. Um, and that's a really fascinating approach for him to take and has a lot of different consequences, I think, as we'll be talking about at various points throughout the class. But um, but to me, it really raises this, this question of not only what is his terrible purpose, but how does his terrible purpose fit in with all these other purposes that we see? Is he just a hand, even if he is a hand that had known pain, right? Um, that is, we might see him as a suffering tool, but in the end, is he still just a tool? Um, but, um, okay, I'm just sort of scanning over uh, questions here. Um, yeah, Matt says, he is a tool in the eyes of the Reverend Mother. I agree, Matt, right, exactly. The question there is, to what extent is she right? Right, you know, to what extent is her view, um, uh, in fact, the accurate one? And that's what we're going to go on to. That that's what we're going to go on to see. Um, so anyway, before we go back to the passages that I ended class with last time, um, I want to I want to jump forward a little bit um, because I think there's a you know a scene which is a, a, a favorite scene of mine um, from today's reading, um, which I think really bears on this question, and and I think will help us when we go back um, to look at those earlier passage, those earlier passages. Um, yeah, and Matt is pointing to, you know, how ironic it is that he's, a, uh, you know, that he should be a tool when he's tested for his humanity. Exactly. I mean, Matt, I think that that irony, I was trying to point to this last time, but but I think we could be even more forceful about that. Um, the, uh, the, the, the irony implicit in the Bene Gesserit program, right? They're doing two things. First, they're identifying humans and separating humans from animals, and then once they find ant humans, they marginalize them and treat them like animals, right? Breeding stock, right? Let's 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 make a bigger, stronger, faster human. Of course, it's not bigger, stronger, faster that they're thinking of, but you know, their their their, their ends are a little bit more mystical than that. Um, but still, in the end, they're breeding them like stock, right? 
and and they're thinking of them as breeding stock primarily. Um, think of the conflict between the Reverend Mother and Jessica about Jessica's bearing a son, right? That 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 clear struggle between mere well, I almost said human sentiment, but boy, wouldn't that be a conspicuous adjective to use under that circumstance, right? But anyway, the, you know, her mere love for her husband uh, versus you know her her loyalty to the grand plan of the Bene Gesserits. She was instructed by the Bene Gesserits to bear daughters to uh, to Leto Atreides because then those daughters could have been bred to uh, to Harka. She was supposed to bear a daughter who could marry Fade Ralph Harkonnen. That's pretty obvious already, right? It could have been married to the Harkonnen heir and the breach have been mended. All right, so here we have Fade Ralph and Paul who are both very similar ages and uh, they, so again, the Bene Gesserit clearly had a plan. Jessica did not follow that plan. Why didn't she follow that plan? Well, she was human, right? She loved her husband. She wanted to, you know, she, she, it meant so much to Leto, and she loves him, and she wants to make him happy. Is that so wrong? Well, you know, I mean, again, so, so Matt, I think I agree that that irony um, of the simultaneous identification of humans and then the dehumanization of the Bene Gesserit breeding program um, seems to me important uh, in really trying to come to grips with what we see happening there with the Bene Gesserits. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, it, Kay is chiding me for calling Duke Leto her husband. You're right, I'm totally misspeaking. Um, uh, uh, but I don't take it back. Um, uh, it's of course important that they are not married, and that's brought up many times. Um, and it's obviously something that pains Jessica. Uh, but I mean, you think of her reaction when uh, um, when when Yui says, "You know, why why did you never make him marry you?" Which is a really offensive thing uh, to say on a couple different levels. Um, but yeah, Kay says Jessica would, would agree with me, don't take it back, and Amber, of course, is quoting the final sentence in the book, uh, history will call them wives. Uh, yeah, 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 no, exactly. I, and, 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 and I think I slipped in calling him her husband because I was talking about her love for him, right? In thinking of it in that context of how she thought about him and how she loves him and how she wanted to please him, um, it's... Um, it's the same thing I, uh, 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 <laughs> at the same time that Amber quoted that, James Hart also quoted it, and Brian, uh, is it Glime, Brian? Or is it Gleam? I'm not quite sure how, how, how to pronounce your, your, your last name there. Um, Brian said, uh, history will call him husband. Yeah, yeah, that's good, that's good. Um, uh, okay, Glime, thanks, thanks. Um, anyway, so, um, I, again, I think all of those things are really important. But again, hang on to all this for a second. We'll come back to it, and um, let's uh, let's 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 look at the conversation between Jessica and the shit out mapes um, on Arrakis. Um, this, of course, raises the issue of the mission of the missionaria protectiva, um, which I really love, though not quite as much as I love the phrase panoplia propheticus, um, which I think I could just sit and read that phrase happily for about fifteen minutes. Um, but uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, the concept of the Missionaria Protectiva is in a sense profoundly anti-religious. That is to say, it is, it is, the, it is the cynical, pre, uh, you know, pre, uh, premeditated manipulation of religious devotion uh, for, you know, using the, the, the earnest religious devotion of peoples as an instrument to accomplish their own ends with perfect cynicism. That is to say, with no no sense at all of belief in the things that they are saying, the, the, the things that they are doing, right? Uh, I mean, the whole thing is really very brilliant. You know, the idea of saying, let us send out missionaries, not to convert them to any belief system, right? But to plant among them certain beliefs for which our own agents will have the key so that they can be prepared later on to take advantage, you know, to, 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 to find resources within these societies so that, uh, um, you know, they can receive whatever help that they need. 
this is I get it, it's it's truly a brilliant plan, um, and we can see it in action here um, between Jessica uh, and Mapes. My husband told me of your title, shit out, Jessica said. I recognized the word. It's a very ancient word. You know the ancient tongues, then? Mapes asked, and she waited with an odd intensity. Tongues are the Bene Gesserit's first learning, Jessica said. I know the Botani Jeeb and the Chakobsa and all the hunting languages. Mapes nodded, just as the legend says. And Jessica wondered, why do I play out this sham? But the Bene Gesserit ways are devious and compelling. I know the dark things and the ways of the Great Mother, Jessica said. She read the more obvious signs in Mapes' actions and appearance, the petite betrayals. Misekes pregia, she said in the Jacobsa tongue, which doubtless I'm butchering. Andral tre pera, trada sik buskakri, misekes paraki, parakri, sorry. Mapes took a backward step, appeared poised to flee. I know many things, Jessica said. I know that you have born children, that you have lost loved ones, that you have hidden in fear and that you have done violence and will yet do more violence. I know many things, in a low voice, Mapes said. I meant no offense, my lady. Now, um, we see a couple things here, right? On the one hand, we see as I said, the, 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 the Missionaria Protectiva and the full Panoplia Propheticus in action, right? Um, uh, and we see that she is aware of the fact that, um, there, that, it's, that it's a sham, right? Um, she knows that this stuff is fake. Now, let me be careful when I say that. Um, uh, Brian Fatterini brings up uh, an interesting uh, point or question. Um, Brian says, I don't believe there's no belief. The, uh, the belief of the Bene Gesserit is in their own destiny. It's a clear twisting of religious fervor and cynical, as you say, but at the end it's a quasi-religious devotion that drives the Bene Gesserits, even if theirs is a science of sleight of hand. Yes, when I say that they have no belief, it's not that they don't believe in anything. I'm not saying that they are purely cynical about everything. Um, as you were saying, Brian, my, my, my accusation of cynicism is merely in the way in which they manipulate the beliefs of others. My point is the distance between what the Bene Gesserit themselves actually believe and the stuff that they're saying. They're planting things, prophecies, which they know to be bogus. These are not revelations. They don't believe in these revelations, right? They do not believe they are telling truth. They are deliberately telling lies in order to make it possible for somebody else to come along and fulfill these prophecies later on, right? In that sense. So it's that distance. It's that distance between the act that they're putting on and what they themselves actually think. Again, it's not that they have no belief whatsoever, but they are, in this sense, like totally, or believe anyway, that they are totally looking over the heads of these other people, right? That is, their eye is on something higher, perhaps. They do, perhaps, as you say, Brian, believe in something. But the stuff that's going on down here, you know, these, these stories that they're telling and these phrases that they are planting and these legends that they are, uh, that they're, um, that they're instilling in the people, it's a means to an end, Brian, as you go on to say. Um, yes, yes. Um, but, um, so anyway, but, but, but again, but, She's aware that it's a sham. She's deliberately playing a part, and she's not really comfortable with it. Why do I play out this sham? Um, she's her own Jessica's own belief here seems to be less than a hundred percent, and that I think is something we see with her from the beginning. Belief, Brian, exactly as you were saying, belief in the Bene Gesserit thing, right? Um, as yeah, again, as we got in that opening scene. Um, based on uh, based on Paul's Y chromosome, we know she's not marching in lockstep with the Bene Gesserits, right? Um, she there are things which well, you can 
characterize it in a couple of ways, right? You could say something, you know, other things which have become to her more important than the Bene Gesserit way. Um, not that she has completely abandoned that or, or, or completely despises it or, you know, she's not an apostate from the Bene Gesserits or anything. Um, but um, she, uh, she, but at the same time, so again, you could say she prioritizes other things higher. Um, you could say that her faith in the Bene Gesserit way uh, is imperfect, has been weakened. Um, that she doubts some of these things. Um, but um, anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, But again, we see her playing a role, right? Especially when she starts doing the, you know, I know the dark things and the ways of the great mother. She's just, she's just, she's just talking here, right? Um, she's tossing out phrases which, based upon her teaching, she's guessing are likely to resonate, um, you know, with Mapes, right? Um, and she seems to hit it, right, with her, uh, with her little Jacobs to. Uh, Jacobs' speech, right? And then she starts engaging in a little bit of charlatanism, right? Um, just drawing some conclusions based on her observations and trying to pass it off as prophetic insight. I know many things, right? So again, so here we see Jessica um, 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 we see Jessica again deliberately, though with some degree of reservation, some degree of self-consciousness, taking part uh, um, in this. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Lauren Danks says, could the devious and compelling Bene Gesserit ways also be compelling Jessica to play out the prophecy? Lauren, I, I think so. I think w that we, we do see exactly that play in that passage there, don't you think? Um, uh, when she says, why do I play out this sham? Her answer is, but the Bene Gesserit ways are devious and compelling. Um, and it, it, that's clearly double-edged, right? On the one hand, um, uh, there are, of course, devious and compelling to the Fremen, right? Um, you know, to the people who are being manipulated by them. But she also can't get around it, right? I mean, the answer to why do I play out this sham is, what else am I supposed to do? Right? I mean, the Missionaria Protectiva did this so that when somebody was in need, you know, when there was a Bene Gesserit sister who was in need, they would have this resource. And there it is. It's right there. Right? It's like low hanging fruit. What's she going to do? Not take advantage of it? You know, is she, not, if she knows this. She sees it working. It's for her advantage. You know, it's easier to say. I'm not sure I'm going to do everything the Bene Gesserit way. I'd like to distance myself from that. Easier to say and harder to walk, right? Um, so yeah, Lauren, I think that that play is 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 uh, is definitely there. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Mike. Uh, Mike Style Time Thurway uh, says, "I like the uh, the candid, casual uh, tone of her formal uh, of her of her um, inner voice. Um, you know, the word sham that she uses in her head versus the formal incantations she presents to Mapes. Yeah, I, I agree, Mike. That uh, the the italicized the direct quotation from her brain that we get there in the middle really stands out because of the 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 the, the register." Right? Why do I play out this sham? Is so f compared to the much more sort of deliberately stilted language that she's using. I know that you have born children, that you have lost loved ones, that you have hidden in fear, and that you have done violence and will yet do more violence. Right? I know many things. Why do I play out this sham? Um, it's very striking. I agree. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Kay Ben Abraham says Jessica and Mr. Rochester clearly attended the same fortune telling camp. Uh, yes, hey, free Jane Eyre reference. There you go. Uh, <laughs> Kay, I had completely forgotten about the Mr. Rochester fortune telling scene. Man, I guess I need to reread Jane Eyre. You know, I'm getting to the time in my life where I where I will sit and ask myself a question like, when was the last time I read Jane Eyre? And I'll say, gosh. 
That was over 20 years ago the last time I read Jane Eyre. Um, but uh, anyway, anyway. Um, uh, more, more. Mapes composed herself, said, The uncleansed who have seen a Chris knife may not leave Arrakis alive. Never forget that, my lady. You've been entrusted with a Chris knife. She took a deep breath. Now the thing must take its course. It cannot be hurried. She glanced at the stacked boxed stacked boxes and piled goods around them. There's work aplenty to while the time for us here. Jessica hesitated. The thing must take its course. That was a specific catchphrase from the Missionaria Protectiva's stock of incantations. The coming of the Reverend Mother to free you. So see, by that phrase, she knows... I mean, this is how cunning and devious, uh, how devious and compelling, right, the Bene Gesserit uh, plans are. Um, there's like a, a code that she can interpret, right? She knows that there are several different sets of prophecies that they'll embed on particular planets. And so she knows by the particular catchphrase which prophecies have been embedded here, right? She can identify it. So here's Jessica. Jessica is able to interpret it. We see see how 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 profoundly different is her perspective on things from Mapes here, right? Hold on, let me finish. Um, but I'm not a Reverend Mother, Jessica thought. And then, great mother, they planted that one here? This must be a hideous place. Notice, by the way, her use of great mother. That was one of the things she tossed off just a minute ago, but she actually appeals to it as a, 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 as an expletive, right? To herself. It's kind of interesting. Um, but anyhow, um, one of the things that, that again, uh, I, that I was just saying that I wanted to emphasize about this passage, I think the dramatic way in which we see that, that difference of insight into the situation emphasized, right? I get that Shadat Mapes, she sees things from way down here, right? She, she's buying all this stuff. She thinks all this stuff is legit. Jessica knows this stuff is not legit, right? These are not real prophecies. These are fake prophecies. You believe them, which is cool, but they're fake prophecies. I not only know what those prophecies are I, and, and, and what the whole plan is so I know how to fulfill your prophecies and you're going to think it's pretty impressive, but... I know, you know, I have that indexed. Like, I know, oh, oh, right, Prophecy G. Yeah, okay, again, I, I, I've seen the last planet we were on, it was Prophecy H, but whatever. I mean, you know, so we can see, again, the way she's looking at things from a totally different point of view, right? She sees more, she knows more, she is the knowing one who, 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 who can interpret, get to the root of all of these things. Jessica is the one who really knows what's going on, whereas poor Mapes doesn't really have any idea what's going on, right? Yeah, probably, right? That's what's really happening here. Mapes is the one who doesn't really understand what's going on, and Jessica is the all-knowing one, right? Um, sort of. Sort of. Maybe. Maybe. Um, yeah, Brian says her grid is larger. Yeah. Um, yeah, her grid is larger. Well, her grid is different. But is it right? Is it possible that MAPE's grid is correct? Remember the irony of this passage. What I mean by that is the irony of this passage when you take this element of it, this difference in insight, this difference in knowingness, right? Again, also illustrated your, you know, if, in the previous passage with what Jessica could read from her observations of Mapes, right? Um, she could, you know, she could read her like a book, right? Again, another example of how Jessica sees and knows all, whereas these things are, these things are mysteries to Mapes, right? Okay. Um, but the irony of that in the context, here are the Atreides on Arrakis, and they don't know jack about Arrakis, right? What we keep, uh, what we keep coming up against, what they keep coming up against, is the profundity of their ignorance, right? Um, remember the business about the shields, right? You know, when the, the Atreides in their in their in their strategy meeting are all like, "What's up? Why don't Fremen wear shields? Is there must be an? I, we must figure out why they wouldn't." And what's the Fremen reaction to shields? They're amused by them, right? 
um, because the Atreides are all completely ignorant. They're 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 not just noobs. They're they're uh, well, they are noobs, but they 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 just they 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 have no idea, right? So in fact, what we keep seeing is most of the time we have the Atreides who are like they're all they're the all knowing, right? They're the wise. They're the they're they're not wise. In fact, they don't know more than the Fremen. They know less than the Fremen. Certainly on the Fremen's home home ground, right? Um, but uh, anyway, um, that irony, that is the fact that Jessica is the one who appears to know all in a context in which the Fremen, if, if this passage, and remember, this, this is actually our first interaction with a Fremen, right? Mapes is the first Fremen we've met. So there's almost a, a, an invitation here an invitation to us as readers to sort of marginalize them, right? Ah, simple-minded, uh, you know, credulous natives, right? That seems to be how Jessica is treating her, right? To be manipulated by the knowing ones. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Michael. Jostowski says uh, they underestimate the Fremen in a similar way to the Harkonnens. Um, they view the Fremen as children rather than slaves or animals, um, but, they're, but they manipulate them all the same. Yeah, I think we can see that element. But again, what we see, certainly what we see when that comes to Duke Leto and uh, you know, Idaho and Stilgar, um, what we see is, you know, no, things aren't actually the Atreides grid, not necessarily more accurate than the Fremen grid. How does the Bene Gesserit grid really stack up? Now, I skipped a passage which several of you have been trying to remind me of, but I'm saving it, say. Um, but you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, Peter Ribsky and several others have been talking about it. Um, this is the passage that, the moment that really, my favorite moment in this exchange. It's a Chris knife, she said. Say it not lightly, Mape said. Do you know its meaning? And Jessica thought there was an edge to that question. Here's the reason this Fremen has taken service with me, to ask that one question. My answer could precipitate violence or what? She seeks an answer from me, the meaning of a knife. She's called the, sh she's called the shutout in the Chakopsa tongue. Knife, that's death maker in Chakopsa. She's getting restive. I must answer now. Delay is as dangerous as the wrong answer. Jessica said, it's a maker... Aye, Mapes wailed. It was the sound of both grief and elation. She trembled so hard the knife blade sent glittering shards of reflection shooting around the room. Jessica waited, poised. She had intended to say the knife was a maker of death, and then add the ancient word, but every sense warned her now all the deep training of alertness that exposed meaning in the most casual muscle twitch. I have to say, it doesn't take a genius to read that one, I think. But anyway, whatever. Um, the key word was maker. Maker? Maker. Still, Mapes held the knife as though ready to use it. Jessica said, Did you think that I, knowing the mysteries of the Great Mother, would not know the Maker? What do we see happening here? Uh, Philip Lord says, uh, It's almost like Bilbo stumbling on the answer to the time riddle. Yes, Philip, it is a lot like... Bilbo stumbling to the answer of the time riddle. Being saved by pure luck, in fact. Now, you could say that it's not quite pure luck. Um, uh, you could say that perhaps the luck of Lady Jessica is more impure than Bilbo's luck was. Um, but it's luck, nevertheless. Um, yeah, Sarah is laughing. As I was laughing even as I was reading it, Sarah, about the, uh, the fact that the question about the knife ha has uh, an edge. Um, um, notice both things that we see happening here both things that are strongly emphasized in this passage on the one hand we see Jessica's cunning at work right she is to do we see we we, we get the full, this long italicized quotation right we get her full thought process including she's getting restive I must answer now Right, delay is as dangerous as the wrong answer. We see her way, trying to reason this out, trying to figure out um, where to go with this. Right, what 
would the correct answer be? Emphasizing two things. One, she doesn't know the answer to the question, right? Um, and that's interesting. It's not just a question of like, hang on, let me consult my handy Missionaria Protectiva, you know, code book here. Okay, and uh, Ryan, this is probably prophecy G. So uh, the answer to the meaning of a knife is she's, you know, she doesn't know, right? So that is already kind of interesting. Having seen her confidence before, she's not a hundred percent sure how to play this. However, her the correct answer. It's a maker. You know, the word maker, that she outs with the word maker, is derived from her own assessment, right? She's translating knife into Chakobsa. If she hadn't known enough Chakobsa and figured out that that was the important language and been able to run with that, she wouldn't have said the right word by accident, right? So it plays a role. It's rooted in her learning, but it's luck. She didn't know the answer. Even in the last line, did you think that I, knowing the mysteries of the Great Mother, would not know the Maker? Yeah, actually, she doesn't know the Maker, right? We, as readers, know. She has no idea what she's talking about. Nor does she probably know the mysteries of the Great Mother. But, you know, um, so again, she's faking it. We know she's faking it. But what just happened here? Yes, Amber, it's an educated guess. I absolutely agree. But at the same time, it was luck. It was a stroke of good fortune that led her to say the thing which would fulfill the prophecy. Obviously, very dramatically fulfill the prophecy. To me. This is the moment when Mapes is convinced, right? Um, you know, she's going to go on to say right after this, Mapes is going to go on to say that, you know, when you've lived with it for so long to actually you know, hear it fulfilled, it's, you know, I mean, she doesn't know how to handle it, right? And the fulfillment is not her playing out the sham, right? It's not the, it's not her charlatan performance, it's not, okay, it's not her pulling the Mr. Rochester that does this to Mapes, right? It's, it's, it's neither her spouting of, of, you know, catchphrases, right? Nor is it her 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 Mr. Rochester impression. No, it's this accident, this verbal accident, like Bilbo's time riddle. Um, and yes, several of you know me well enough to start saying, "If luck, you call it," because that's exactly the question here, right? Is there any chance that she actually is the one? What if? the prophecy is true. What if the Fremen grid is correct, actually? What if of the two of them, Mapes is actually the one who's the knowing one, and Jessica is ignorant? If that were true, if the Fremen grid is accurate, and there is a prophecy, and Jessica were the one whom the prophecy foretold, she may, in fact, give the answer. You might possibly expect her to give the, answer, the correct answer to the question by chance, not even fully understanding what she's saying or what she's doing, right? And, of course, we have the, the sharp irony of that happening in the context of Jessica performing a sham fulfillment of the prophecy, right? But the thing, the central thing which convinces Mapes isn't a part of that sham. It's an accident. It's lucky. So is it possible that the, the prophecies planted cynically without belief by the Missionaria Protectiva is actually true? Did the Missionaria Protectiva know better than they knew in some sense? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Yeah, Kevin was uh, was uh, saying he had he had been talking about this before. Exactly, Ke Kevin Morgan was uh, was uh, was pointing to this earlier. I think it's a really important question. This is obviously something we're going to come back to a lot over the course of this book. Um, this is something that's going to be held in tension throughout most of this book, um, and I want us to be thinking about this pretty carefully as we go through. Um, 
we're going to see this same thing. Essentially, Paul and Jessica, but primarily Paul, Wagdeeb, you know, um, we're going to see them and their careers through two different grids, at least two, right? Um, what do we do with that? Anyway, um, I want to go back now, having thought about this stuff, I want to now go back to the old passages. Um, for those of you, uh, again, who are, who are uh, new students, haven't done many of these classes with me before, if any of you are laughing right now because we're 45 minutes into the class and I'm just now saying, okay, now it's time for us to go back and finish the stuff we didn't do last time before we really move on to what I really wanted to talk about tonight, um, then now you're in, you're in good company with the rest of my students who, who know me better. Um, but um, <laughs> anyway, uh, let's go back. Here's Jessica and the Reverend Mother talking. I ask only what you see in the future with your superior abilities. I see in the future what I've seen in the past. You well know the pattern of our affairs, Jessica. And she goes on to explain, right, about how, you know, that, that they have observed um, how things work. This is the pattern of history, right? And she's going to go on and say, we understand how all these things work. The Bene Gesserits have the, the high vantage point where they see all these things working together. They have the long vantage point where they've studied these things over history. Their grid is the most all-encompassing grid that there is, right? They're not just focusing on their own house or their own, you know, the emperor is focused on his own power. They are taking the widest view and the longest view of all of humanity, right? At least that's what we're sort of getting here from the Reverend Mother. But again, notice here, what I hear is still a kind of tension in those first two lines of this passage. I ask only what you see in the future with your superior abilities. I, I detect a bit of acerbity in uh, Jessica's comment there, but um, I see in the future what I've seen in the past. That is, on the one hand, there is this source of this, this this mystical source of knowledge for the Bene Gesserits. She, the Reverend Mother, she is a Reverend Mother, right? She has um, taken the truth drug. She has gained insight into things which are beyond the perception of normal people, right? She has, in this sense, superior abilities. Jessica is appealing to her, her superior abilities. What is your insight into the future? And the answer that she gets is not, I have seen in my trance this thing, right? Instead, she gets what we are going to see in the future is determined by what we've seen in the past, right? It's a pattern of history. That is to say, a decidedly non-mystical uh, thing with which somebody without superior abilities could well have deduced, right? Um, so th that tension is already pretty interesting, but we see a lot here about the Bene Gesserit views on their own grid. Now back to this passage which I spent less time on, um, talking about the post-Butlerian Jihad thing. We have two chief survivors of those ancient schools, the Bene Gesserit and the Spacing Guild. The Guild, so we think, emphasizes almost pure mathematics. The Bene Gesserit performs another function, politics, he said. Um, and then, uh, okay, the original Bene Gesserit school was directed by those who saw the, th the need of a thread of continuity in human affairs. They saw there could be no such continuity without separating human stock from, hum from animal stock for breeding purposes. Okay, now we've talked about that. Here's the bit that I am so fascinated by in the context that we've been discussing. The old woman's words abruptly lost their special sharpness for Paul. He felt an offense against what his mother called his instinct for rightness. It wasn't that Reverend Mother lied to him. She obviously believed what she said. It was something deeper, something tied to his terrible purpose. Um, so, again, the several observations that I think are crucial for us to make here. Well, no conclusions that are crucial for us to draw here. Um, I like to, I sometimes get sloppy about this, um, which I shouldn't do. That is, between the, in the difference between observations and conclusions. Um, it's a very important distinction uh, when you're, well, really doing anything. It's really important. But anyway, a um, couple of important conclusions that we can draw. One, his 
special abilities, right? His superior abilities are more superior than hers. Um, that is, she does not even seem to understand what truth sense means to Paul. Um, she defined the truth sense, that ability to... She is the... She is the, 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 the uh, her job with the emperor, right, is to detect truth. But she defines that as knowing when people believe what they say. She can tell when somebody's lying because she can detect the gap between belief and utterance. Kind of ironic thinking about Jessica's little sham performance, right? That thing that the Bene Gesserit do all the time, they can see that a mile away, apparently. Okay, fine. Um, uh, but Paul's insight is beyond that he can tell that she believes what she said but he has an instinct for rightness that goes beyond that like he has access to the like objective grid on reality and he can tell when something doesn't line up to it I don't know if that's a fair analogy to make but it's kind of like that anyway that seems to be what his instinct for rightness is she's not lying but in a deeper sense, he can tell what she said is wrong. The Bene Gesserit grid, Paul believes, is wrong. What they're doing, what they believe in, isn't true. Um, um, yeah, good, Patrick. Patrick Summer says, uh, it's better than a lie detector. It's a truth detector, which is a very different thing. Um, yeah, it knows if someone is honest and correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Um, and that is tied to his terrible purpose. So again, we return to the earlier question. Is Paul's terrible purpose merely the fulfillment of the Bene Gesserit purpose, right? The Bene Gesserit have been trying to breed the Quisans Haderach. He might be the Quisans Haderach. Spoiler, he's the Quisans Haderach. I bet you are guessing that already. Again, no secrets in this book. Um, um, also, he's not going to die in the book. He's totally going to live, right? It's a little spoiler there. I hate to give that away. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, but that's what this book does, right? From the first epigram, it does that. Um, we know much of what's going to be happening in the future, right? Um, but again, this is, this is how this book functions, right? Um, by giving everything away at the beginning, in fact. Um, at the beginning and throughout the course of the book. Um, keep an eye on this, actually. Um, do you think there's anything in the story that comes as a surprise? If so, make sure to bring it to my attention as we go past it. Um, because if that does happen, I think it will be really important. Um, I'm not thinking, I'm not playing with you. I'm not, I'm not thinking of anything off the top of my head. Um, I can't recall. I don't think so. But, um, uh, but, but anyway, we'll, 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 uh, uh, we'll see. As we go along, we'll see. Um, I don't want you to do it right now. Because, again, I don't want to talk about stuff that happens later in the book. Because, again, you know, I'm totally anti-spoilers. Um, uh, but, uh, but anyway, um, Back to the back to the, the the grids and the terrible purpose. So the question is, he might be the Quisant Tanarak. Maybe that's his terrible purpose, right? So when he perceives this, remember, like he felt like he was infected with terrible purpose. Remember that it, it, by her words, by the experience of the Gom Jabbar, by something that she did and something that she said, he feels like he was infected with terrible purpose. And we know he 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 recognizes that she 
did something to him. She has some kind of hold on him. He's trying to warn his father about what she said, and he like physically can't say it or has a really hard time saying it, right? Um, and he kind of marvels at, like, what did she do to me? He's been infected with terrible purpose. So maybe it's a Bene Gesserit thing, right? Maybe that's a way of saying, okay, yeah, so he... Um, he uh, um, his, he's, he's the Kwisatz Haderach, and, and that's what the terrible purpose is. And so, basically, this is just sort of him becoming aware of the fact that he's a tool, right? Um, that, like, he, he has some inkling of the fact that he's being driven by this thing beyond his control, and it's the Bene Gesserits and, and all that. No, no. The Bene Gesserits are wrong. Their grid isn't inclusive. It's, it's not completely accurate. Um, he can see things that they can't see. And then we see him confronting her on the subject of the Kwisatz Haderach, a passage which we barely at all got to talk about last time. Paul felt himself coming more and more out of the shock of the test. He leveled a measure, measuring stare at her, said, you say maybe I'm the Kwisatz Haderach? What's that, a human gomjabar? Paul, Jessica said, you mustn't take that tone with, I'll handle this, Jessica, the old woman said. Now, lad, do you know about the truthsayer drug? You take it to improve your ability to detect falsehood, my mother's told me. Have you ever seen truth trance? No. The drug's dangerous, but it gives insight. When a truthsayer is gifted by the drug, she can look many places in her memory, in her body's memory. We look down so many avenues of the past, but only feminine avenues. Her voice took on a note of sadness. Yet there's a place where no truthsayer can see. We're repelled by it terrorized. It is said a man will come one day and find in the gift of the drug his inward eye. He will look where we cannot into both feminine and masculine pasts. Your Cuisance Haderach? Yes. The one who can be many places at once. The Cuisance Haderach. She defines Cuisance Haderach as the one who can be many places at once. She also confesses though it's not exactly in the spirit of confession, that the Bene Gesserit grid is limited, right? They can look down so many avenues of the past. The so there, I think, is important, right? It's not just we look down many avenues of the past, but we look down so many, but only feminine avenues, right? There's so much that we see, but we don't see everything. In fact, we only see like half of things, right? Um, we only have half of the picture, in fact. But one will come who will have the complete picture. Um, one who will be able to be many places at once. She... Uh, um, Let's see, Joey asks, is there a stated reason that I missed as to why a man can see into both paths, but a woman can see only the feminine? No, this is the only explanation we get of that here. Um, first of all, we know that the Bene Gesserits are all about the genetics, right? They're all about the breeding and all that stuff. Um, I've always understood this. I feel like we're being invited, given all the talk about genetics from the Bene Gesserits and the, you know, the... the um, yeah, you know their their breeding patterns and stuff. That um, that we're, this is that it's genetically based, exactly as Tom uh, Hillman and Brian Federini are just saying. Um, you know the uh, double X chromosome versus X Y. That's kind of how I've always understood it too. Exactly, um, because she emphasizes they look down. Uh, they look in many places in her body's memory. Right, um, and again, it's all for, with the Bene Gesserits. It's all about genetics. Um, uh, but um, whereas the Y chromosome gives him, but see, saying this, saying it that way, seems to me to simplify things, over simplify things in a kind of a dangerous way. Again, because the Bene Gesserit don't really understand, I don't think. Um, and we'll see this more as we move through. Um, but they think they understand. She's explaining about the truth drug. 
what it is, what it does, and how it works, right? You can look many places in your body's memory, she says. That's how the truth drug works, is what it does. Um, uh, whereas more such avenues will be available to um, the man, the one singular man who's able to do this, um, which seems to be correlated with genetics, but not necessarily, I mean, again, I'm not convinced that that's the whole thing, but then again, I'm not convinced that any of this stuff is really true. That is, I'm not sure that, I, I take her entire speech here with a sort of a grain of salt. Um, how well does she really understand um, uh, what's going on here, right? Um, and we'll look at this again later on when we come back to the truth drug and reverend motherhood and everything later on. Um, but uh, Paul's definition of the Kwisatz Haderach is different, right? He calls the Kwisatz Haderach uh, a human gom jabar, um, which is fascinating. And let's squirrel that away and think about the potential relevance of that image later on. We'll be reminded of the gom jabar anyway in the final scene of the book. Um, and I would just ask you to kind of, uh, if you are the kind of person who turns down the corners of pages in your books, I would recommend that for this here. Uh, if you uh, do not do such things, then make a note somewhere. Um, put a little electronic sticky in your Kindle book or something uh, on that particular, on this particular passage, because I think it, it, is, a, it, is, a, it is an image, it is a metaphor, which bears thinking about. Uh, later on when we come to the end of the story. Um, uh, yeah, Kevin is firmly of the opinion that people who turn their pages down clearly are related to the Harkonnens. Uh, I, 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 I completely can sympathize with this, uh, this point of view. Um, but anyway, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll sort of come back to this, but again, it's the question of, of the grid, right? and, 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 and I, I come back to um, I come back to shit out Mapes and Jessica, right? Who is more knowing? Um, somebody, Tom, was it Tom? Let me see, hang on a second. If I can find it back again. Not sure I can I have a hard time doing this. Um, uh, if somebody else said it, tell me. I think it was Tom um, who said that in this pass, in the in the passage, in this, this the conversation with the Reverend Mother, um, Paul, you know, especially the one where we were, we were talking about the the, uh, the truth sense and the instinct for rightness, that Paul seems to be to the Reverend Mother as Jessica seems to be to the Shaddaq Mapes in the sense of being the one who knows and sort of looking past and beyond um, the things that are believed by the other person there. Um, I think it's an interesting. It's not a perfect parallel, but I but I do think that that's it's it's um, sort of interesting. Um, but um, one last passage. Then you know, since we're an hour into class, then it'll be time to start what I really wanted to talk about today. Jessica looking in on on Paul. Jessica stared at her son, seeing the oval shape of face so like her own. But the hair was the duke's, coal-colored and tousled, long lashes concealed with lime-toned eyes. Jessica smiled, feeling her fears retreat. She was cu suddenly caught by the idea of genetic traces in her son's features, her lines and eyes and facial outline, but sharp touches of the father peering through that outline like maturity emerging from childhood. She thought of the boy's features as an exquisite distillation of, out of random patterns, endless cues of happenstance meeting at this nexus. The thought made her want to kneel beside the bed and take her son in her arms, but she was inhibited by Yui's presence. She stepped back and closed the door softly. Um, I love the fact that her first words are, what sweet abandon in a child, in the slumber of a child, right? And he's faking. He's not even asleep. He's like the best sleep faker ever. Um, uh, but anyway, um, yes, Philip Lord is pointing out how she misses the point of his true ancestry. Um, hey, that's a surprise. See, look, there you go. There's something. But it's a really ill-kept secret. Right? There are all these heavy hints about it before it breaks. Um, but anyway, let's, 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 let, let's keep an eye on that one as we move forward. 
the thing that really struck me about this passage is the way in which Herbert brings together the two things, right? On the one hand, this, this idea of Paul as the genetic nexus, right, is a dominant idea. You know, again, from literally from scene one, we've been, you know, given this, perhaps he's the one. Right? Perhaps he is the Kwisatz Haderach. Perhaps he is the one towards which this entire, very long-term, multi-generational breeding project has been moving towards. Right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's it. Maybe, may, you know, maybe he is. Um, of course, he he is. But. Well, we see this personalized here, right? So we have that that idea, which has been a big idea all the way through, and part of his terrible purpose and the Bene Gesserit plan, um, and the way in which that fact strikes her and fills her with very personal affection for him, right? Um, not as Bene Gesserit towards Quisant's Haderach, um, not uh, even as ducal concubine to future ducal heir, right? Not even as, um, but just as mother to son. Um, the way that the personal line, again, we, we know that this is a big thing for her, right? That this tension between those two things in her are really, um, are really prominent, right? Are really important um, because they, um, uh, because they, um, uh, you know, they, we 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 saw them in tension back with the, you know, the the duke, uh, her husband, right, and uh, um, and this kind of thing. But um, yeah, Patrick says it's not just his facial features that are an exquisite distillation, but his entire being, um, all the contributing factors to his identity combined to increase this destiny. Yeah, he's this creature of destiny. Um, but also her personal love for him. You know, the way that we've, he's, we see these things brought together. You know, what is he? Who is he? The agent of destiny, right? Is he a vehicle, right? Is he an instrument of fate? Is he an, the, a, the tool of the Bene Gesserits? But in this moment, we're reminded he's her little boy, right? Uh, he's a person. Um, anyway, so I, I think that, again, that's an important tension for us to be looking at moving forward, not just in fact of his being Jessica's son, but the, uh, the humanity of Muad'Dib. Um, anyway, let's move on to what I really wanted to talk about, which is Duke Leto. Um, not, um, uh, not to spoil anything, but, uh, Duke Leto's days are numbered, um, he's probably not going to make it. Um, it's not like that was prophesied in chapter one or anything. If chapter one had been numbered, which would have been convenient. But um, anyway, I want to look at Duke Leto while we still have him. This first chapter that we read today contains uh, this moment, which is like the English teacher's delight, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, Matt Shaw says uh, uh, Duke Leto should obviously be played by Sean Bean in the next film version uh, of Dune. Uh, uh, Matt, I absolutely uh, uh, endorse that nomination. Uh, clearly, clearly. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, look at the scene. Against a carton to her right stood the painting of the Duke's father. Wrapping twine hung from it like a frayed decoration. A piece of the twine was still clutched in Jessica's left hand. Beside the painting lay a black bull's head mounted on a polished board. The head was a dark island in the sea of wadded paper. Its plaque lay flat on the fo floor, and the bull's shiny muzzle pointed at the ceiling as though the beast were ready to bellow a challenge into this echoing room. Jessica wondered what compulsion had brought her to uncover the, those two things first, the head and the painting. She knew that there was something symbolic in the action. Not since the day when the Duke's buyers had taken her from the school had she felt this frightened and unsure of herself. The head and the picture. Okay, okay. Um, uh, I 
I've got some pretty finely tuned antenna for symbolism. You know, I can I can detect it when it's really really subtle. And you know, I suspect that there's something symbolic here. I, I you might think I'm crazy. You might think that there's nothing there, but I think something is symbolic. <laughs> I just love that line. I, you know, so she she knew that there was something symbolic whack, in the action. Okay, all right, got it. With you, Frank Herbert. Um, I love that. Love it. But but again, it's not. So this is um. This is a move that I would call. Uh, that I would call the, uh, what would I call it? Uh, the Demi Dickens. That's what I would call it. Um, Charles Dickens is my favorite author who always spells out his symbols, right? Who just cannot possibly bear to let a symbol remain a symbol for the reader to interpret on their own. Like, he just, like, he starts to, uh, to, like, Look, you know, sometimes he'll almost look like he's going to do it, and then he'll just come back and spell it right out for you. Like he just can't bear it. You can see him like he just starts to get all all, all twitchy and jumpy. Nathaniel Hawthorne was the same way, certainly in the Scarlet Letter, um, which I reread a few years back and found really comical in that regard. Um, and then there are other authors who are extremely restrained and and won't really shove it in your face at all. Um, including uh, authors on the other extreme, such as Chaucer in my Canterbury Tales class that I just finished teaching um, uh, at, uh, at, at Mythgard. I was um, uh, talking about how Chaucer is, is, seems almost to dare you to misinterpret it. Like, in fact, he seems almost to try to goad his readers into misinterpreting um, uh, his, his, uh, his, you know, sort of his, his symbol, what's, what's going on here. What Herbert does in this moment it's like I said, it's like the Demi Dickens. It's like halfway, right? On the one hand, he brings out the hammer and smacks you with the symbol, right? The head and the picture. But he doesn't do the full Dickens, right? He doesn't ex actually explain it. He doesn't tell us what it is. He does leave us to interpret it after openly daring us to do so, or at least openly uh, prompting us to do so, right? So... I'm keen to take his prompting here. Uh, let's talk about this. Let's think about this. What do we see here? Some compulsion. It's like what she's wondering what compulsion led her to unpack. The first thing she unpacks in the new house is the portrait of the old duke and the, 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 the stuffed head of the bull that killed him. Okay. Um, we are also instructed... Not since the day when the Duke's buyers had taken her from the school had she felt this frightened and unsure of herself. Okay, context for the symbol is her own... Because remember, it's, it's connected with her action, not just with the things, right? They, they, it sounds kind of, they sound kind of symbolic all by themselves, but they're also being associated with her own mindset, right? Her own frame of mind, her own feelings. She's feeling terribly frightened and unsure. And in that state of being frightened and unsure of herself, she chooses, for some probably symbolic reason, to unpack these two things first the bull's head and the portrait. Um, what do we. What do we get from this? Let's start with observations. Um, as you see, I, I titled this slide Bull versus Duke 1. Um, we're going to get four of these passages uh, over the course of this chapter. Just love this. I mean, I, man, I tell you, English teachers just eat passages like this for breakfast. Um, what do we see? What do we get here? What, what, uh, um, what are you guys reading here? Um, uh, you know, Brian says we've got the great... Uh, Brian... Fatterini, I should specify, says uh, the graven image and the source of death, the idea and its destruction. Okay, we've got the, the premonition of their doom, says Philip Menzies. Yeah, we, certainly we have, um, you know, there's, there certainly does seem to be something telling in that. The, the parallel, right, between the old duke and the new duke seems suggestive, right? Um, the duke and the thing that killed him. Now, the new duke... Well, spoiler alert, um, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say it anyway, because I'm wild and reckless tonight with the spoilers. Duke Leto is not going to be killed by a bull. Actually, that's not what's going to happen. Um, but we know that Baron Harkonnen is coming after him, and we get the, you know, with, 
he weighs almost as much as a bull. Um, but no, anyway, I mean, you know, we we get the 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 you know the the the, the huge black bull. Um, uh, so I mean, I, we uh, we can certainly see certain parallels uh, between the bull and Baron Harkonnen. So so okay, you know, we can we can um, uh, we can we can we can get that. We can sort of see this happening. Um, uh, And yeah, Neil is going further to say that Duke Leto dies in trying to kill the bull Harkonnen. Yeah, yeah, there is something a little bit reminiscent of a matador in a bull ring about what Duke Leto is doing, right? Um, I don't think it's that much of a stretch to see it. When Leto knows right, I'm in going to Arrakis, he knows he's entering the trap, right? He knows exactly what Baron Harkonnen is going to do. That is to say, he knows exactly, you know, but he knows about the Sardaukar, he, or at least he's deduced about the Sardaukar, right? Um, but um, he goes to Arrakis anyway, right? And there's a little bit of a, you know, a Toro, Toro element about what he's doing, I think, right? I dare you to charge at me. Right, um, and what he's hoping to do is slip aside and counterattack. Um, so you know, I, I, I can, I can, I, I can get into it a little bit. Um, I, I can, I can, I can definitely think about that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Elizabeth points out we have some more dehumanizing language. Jessica was bought by the Duke. Yeah, it's interesting that kind of tossed in there, isn't it? Um, dehumanizing is important. Thing. Hey, not only is this Elizabeth, this is Elizabeth Bateman. How are you, Liz? I haven't seen you in forever. Sorry, reunion with an old student here. Um, uh, those of you who have podcast, been podcast listeners of mine for a while, this is Elizabeth Bateman, whose uh, uh, who's theory on, 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 on Tolkien and, uh, and stories of suffering, we, uh, we talked about, you know, we talked about her thesis uh, years ago. Uh, anyway, good to, good, to, good to hear from you, Liz. Um, uh, anyway, um, uh, so we've got we've got celebrities. We've got like three or four members of the Silmarillion seminar. And uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, okay. So all right. So we, we, there's certainly some stuff that we can see coming on here. But wait, but wait, hang on. There's there's more. Um, Mark Womack points out we get we also get human versus animal again, don't we? Though, let's look at passage number two. He, this is the Duke Leto now, he glanced at the painting of his father. Where were you going to hang that? <laughs> you can see there's clearly a, where were you going to hang that? Somewhere in here, no. The word rang flat and final, telling her she could use trickery to persuade, but open argument was useless. Still, she had to try, even if the gesture served only to remind herself that she would not trick him. My lord, she said, if you'd only, the answer remains no. I indulge you shamefully in most things, not in this. I've just come from the dining hall where there are... My lord, please, the choice is between your digestion and my ancestral dignity, my dear, he said. They will hang in the dining hall. She sighed. Yes, my lord. What do we do with this? What do we do with this? Um... Thoughts. We see here a tension again between what exactly? He says between her digestion and his ancestral dignity, right? I indulge you shamefully in most things, but not in this. She had a choice between her love for him and her obedience to the Bene Gesserit way, to her deliberate, her explicit instructions from the Bene Gesserit, and she chose him, right? He's got her ancestral, his ancestral dignity on the one hand, and his love for her on the other hand, right? And he's choosing his ancestral dignity, the dignity of House Atreides. Now, that's interesting. Um, uh, it, 
in its way. Um, Neil is calling Leto bullheaded uh, in his uh, uh, adherence to this. That, gosh, that is a phrase that kind of suggests itself, isn't it? Um, yeah, he is acting a little bullheaded here. Um, I was thinking of the same phrase for some reason, Neil. Um, good. Now, another point, or rather, another question. Um, what does hanging these two things in the dining room have to do with his ancestral dignity? Let me state that. Let me, let me, let me, let me put that in the indicative. Isn't it interesting that he feels that his ancestral dignity is connected to hanging those things in the dining room? Notice she wasn't saying, actually, I found a lovely place in the walk-in closet downstairs, right? They'd look great down there. She's not saying that, right? She's not pulling the whole, oh, we'll put them in the spare bedroom thing, right? Um, I, no, no. What she's saying is, we'll put them in the entry hall. Right? We'll put them in this big reception hall. It's no, no. The dining room must be the dining room. Um, yeah, Stephen Schoenwolf says there's also the question of of you know ex how ancestral it is since it's just his father and the means of his father's death. It's an odd trophy, isn't it? And notice it's got. Well, we'll get there. Um, but he connects this with the dignity of his house, of his ancestral dignity. Um, okay, well, let's hold on to that. We'll come back to it. Number three. Um, Jessica turned away, faced the painting of Leto's father. It had been done by the famed artist, Albi, during the old Duke's middle years. He was portrayed in matador costume, with a magenta cape flung over his left arm. The face looked young, hardly older than Leto's now, with the same hawk features, the same gray stare. You know, those same features that she was detecting in Paul, right? How he takes after his father, and like, you know, maturity coming forth out of childhood, right? The father's features. Anyway, um, she clenched her fists at her sides, glared at the painting. Damn you, damn you, damn you, she whispered. Okay. So she... Uh, got the painting out so she could cuss at it, uh, I guess. No, she's cussing at it in reaction to it. Just happened, I guess, right? Sort of. Um, <laughs> Kevin Morgan says, I don't think we're supposed to think Jessica likes the old Duke. You know, Kevin, I was picking up on that too, because again, finely tuned antenna I have, right? I am a careful reader of literature, and I too uh, had formed the theory that she dislikes the old Duke. Um, She's angry at Leto, and she turns and yells at the old Duke. Um, Trevor Briarly asks, is she mad at Leto for his bravado, i.e. for bringing them all to this hellhole? Yeah, and maybe, and the extent to which it's kind of like the old Duke. Again, the, both things. One, he died. How did he die? Okay, ancestral dignity, right? So... My father died a noble death, right? And the noble, self-sacrificial death of my father shall always be remembered. So I'm sorry if the, you know, the memorial of my father's noble death and the, you know, which is like a, a, a symbol of the dignity of my house offends you, but I, I can't take it down. Uh, no, actually he died in a bullfight, which presumably wasn't something that he did self-sacrificially, nor something that was especially heroic. As Trevor says, he died entertaining people. Um, um, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, it wouldn't seem that it would be much to be um, hugely proud about, right? It's not like, this is the proudest moment in the long history of the Atreides, right? My father 
was a bullfighter, which is kind of dumb and in some ways a little despicable. But anyway, he was and was killed kind of stupidly by a bull uh, while bullfighting. Um, but we afterwards killed the bull that killed him, and uh, there's his head, the bull's head too. So the not only just the reminder of him, of his, you know, life, is that the reminder of his life? Seriously? Like, my father, the amateur matador? Like, that's what we're, like, we're going to get teary about? Um, okay. And the bull that killed him. You know, not just like, and that's the greatest bull my father ever killed in the ring. My father killed hundreds of bulls in the ring, but boy, that one was the legendary black bull of... No, that's um, not what it is. Right? It's the bull that killed him. So when he didn't kill, it's his father's defeat. And in its way, ignominious defeat. One is almost tempted to say, at least I'm almost tempted to say, foppish defeat of his father, right? Like, you know, there's my father, uh, uh, dressed in tights and sequins, doing something dangerous and totally unnecessary uh, for the entertainment of others, and he died doing it. Um, But again, coming back to the, the parallel that Trevor was making, right? Um, Leto, too, is deliberately going into harm's way. He's deliberately placing himself in the path of the charging bull. He knows the bull is there. He knows it's charging. He knows it's as strong and powerful as the bull. Not just because the Baron's really fat. But, but again, like, I mean, like legions of Sardaukar are coming, right? He knows this. Right? He knows he cannot, just as a, a bullfighter, can't like brace himself uh, you know, and take on the charge of the bull. So Leto knows he's not going to be able just to take them on toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Yeah, again, he has hopes for the Fremen, right? Let's get five battalions of, of, uh, um, of Fremen together and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do that. But um, <laughs> Erica says is it is a reminder of how he does not want to die, stupidly. Maybe, maybe. Um, uh, yeah, Carolyn Morehouse suspects it reflects the the Atreides' predilection for being noble and not backing down even if it kills them. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, possibly. Um, yeah, Mark Womack appropriately reminds us of the Reverend Mother saying of the old Duke, there was a man who appreciated the power of bravura even in death. And Mark, I think you're really, you are very correct to remind us of what the text actually said. We've already been given a cue. Before we see this, right, before we see the bullfighter bull thing, we've already been given um, a clue about how to interpret that from the Reverend Mother. Now we have to remember the source and her grid and all that kind of thing, but still, um, the power of bravura even in death. And again, combining that, Mark, you're, you're reminding us with that passage with Trevor's observation about the parallel there between the, both the positive and negative parallels between the situation in which Duke Leto has placed the entire Atreides family and the position into which the old Duke placed himself in the bullring. Um, and she's mad. She's mad. She's mad at him, the old duke. Um, and yeah, it does. Um, it does seem to be. It does seem like she. I think she's projecting a little bit here. Um, and uh, Trevor was just drawing our attention to the later passage. I'll. I'll I want to jump to that right away in her conversation with Yui when she talks about the duke, and we see this come out much more clearly. Besides Wellington, the duke is really two men. One of them I love very much. He's charming, witty, considerate, tender, everything a woman could desire. But the other man is cold, callous, demanding, selfish, as harsh and cruel as a winter wind. That's the man shaped by the father, her face contorted. If only that old man had died when my duke was born. Tell us how you really feel, Jessica. Don't, don't feel like you have to hold back for our sakes. Um, uh... She sees this division. Um, the Duke is two men, one of which she loves and the other of which is much like his father and which she despises. Um, 
Okay. More. Let's see. I, can everybody hear me? I'm just ask quickly. I had at least one person lose sound. I just want to make sure. I had a couple problems with that recently. Everybody hear me all right? Okay. Good. Good. Just checking. Um, hang on to this. We'll, 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 we'll put this in with the last one. Let's get uh, passage number four. Um, her instructing Mapes now after their conversation. The painting of the old duke over there, it must be hung on one side of the dining hall. The bull's head must go on the opposite wall of the painting. to the painting. Mapes crossed to the bull's head. What a great beast it must have been to carry such a head, she said. She stooped. I'll have to be cleaning it first, won't I, my lady? No, but there's dirt caked on its horns. That's not dirt, Mapes. That's the blood of our duke's father. Those horns were sprayed with a transparent fixative within hours after this beast killed the old duke. Mapes stood up. Ah, now, she said. It's just blood, Jessica said. Old blood at that. Get some help hanging these now. The, the beastly things are heavy. Did you think the blood bothered me? Mapes asked. I'm of the desert, and I've seen blood aplenty. And then skipping a little bit. On which side of the dining hall shall I hang one of these, which one of these pretties, my lady? Mapes asked. Ever the practical one, this Mapes, Jessica thought. She said, use your own judgment, Mapes. It makes no real difference. My favorite line. It makes no real difference. Okay, so... Not only do they have to be hung in the dining room, they have to be hung in a particular way in the dining room, right? Not side by side, right? Across the room from each other, facing each other, facing each other across the table. That is what the, ans the ancestral dignity uh, requires. What do we see? What do we see here? Um, there are many words and phrases that really jump out here. And by the way, I find that this, um, I find that this book is just full of these words and phrases that just sort of leap out. I mean, when you look at them, when you look, when you pause, that's why I love doing this so much, um, you know, doing classes like this where, you know, doing classes in this way, uh, you know, when we go through and look at passages carefully together, there's so many times that words and phrases just pop out at you um, and, uh, and, and, and sort of resonate. You can feel it resonating through so many other things in the text. Um, Stephen Schoenwolf points out the phrase old blood. It's just blood old blood at that. Um, and, uh, you know, Stephen says, surely the Atreides would be proud of the fact that their bloodline is old um, and uh, goes back uh, further than Carino. Um, yeah, absolutely. And when I said that, um, uh, Brian exactly anticipated which phrase I was about to read. Uh, exactly, exactly. Um, another one, of course, and one that, uh, that Kevin was just pointing to um, is... Uh, Jessica's remark, get some help hanging these now. The beastly things are heavy. The uh, adjective beastly seems uh, conspicuous, right? Um, also, well, hang on a second, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, Peter Ripsky says, ancestral dignity requires that Duke Leto faces the bull as his father faced the bull. He cannot flee, even though he's wished it, and Jessica cannot or is unwilling to compel him to do so. She wanted him to go renegade, right? He, she did not want, not want him to come to Arrakis. Um, yes, yes, but he's going to face the bull, and he insists for his ancestral dignity that his father in matador costume should be put facing the bull with its head down and his father's blood still on its horns, in the other way. The insistence upon the confrontation with evil, right, the confrontation with your enemy, um, as well as the recognition of danger, and beyond the recognition of danger, I mean, the bull's head, the, the portrait could just be a portrait, right? There's dad, let's keep dad's portrait around. Okay, fine. The bull is a memento mori, to use the medieval term. It's a reminder of death, 
right? His father's blood is still on the horns. Um, that is way beyond, oh, and this happens to be the bull that killed him. No, it's his blood is still there on the horns of the beast that killed him. Um, it's a reminder of mortality. It's got to be. I mean, can you even escape that? Uh, I mean, if you were, if that was, if it was your dad, I mean, would you ever not be able to? And there's dad's blood on the horns of the beast that killed him. I mean, kind of really brings it home to you, uh, doesn't it? Um, um, two things more. I want to. I want to get at here. One, it makes no real difference. The beastly things are heavy. Who is it? Mark? Womack? Were you the one talking about human versus animal here at the beginning, right? Coming from those first few chapters, we um, we um, we get the picture and the head, right? The beast and the man, the animal and the human. And let's put them up on the opposite walls of the room facing each other, human, animal, right? It makes no real difference. The old duke wasn't human. Not in the Bene Gesserit sense. You know, I, I haven't seen his record. I, I doubt he was tested with the Gom Jabbar, but um, based on what we've heard about the definitions between human and animal, mm, I'm not sure the old Duke would have passed the test. Um, kind of sounds like he might have chewed off his own hand, actually, um, and not passed the human test. Jessica says it makes no difference, right? Um, she lumps the two together. She's got the two of them standing next to each other, right? She's looking at the two of them, the picture and the head. And the Duke is like, oh, don't forget to put them up on the dining room, right? Cross from each other. It doesn't make any difference. Michael asked, is, it, is there a difference between Leto and Harkonnen? Yeah, we were looking at that last time, right? In fact, we were even seeing ways in which the 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 you know the Atreides and the Harkonnen um, distinction seems to almost map onto the human versus animal thing. We're looking in particular about their attitude towards the Fremen, and they, we, there's definitely some some evidence in that direction. Um, but the Duke is two men, right? One is lovable, the other is not. One is human, the other is animal. Is does she see sort of see this? And I mean, I guess she sees his father in him, right? And she hates his father in him, um, and she hates his father for the fact that part of his father is in him, right? Um, he's not all that way, but he's not he's not all animal, but he's not all human either. In this sense, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out—I don't want to spend too much time on this—but the business with Mapes and the blood. Um, she thinks it's dirt on the horns because you know <laughs> she makes the wild and crazy assumption that like. That junk that, you know, is uh, staining the, is probably not, you know, she doesn't guess the real answer, right? Like, you know, who wouldn't have seen that coming? Um, but anyway, so she um, she's like, I should clean him off. And no, so it says it's the blood of our Duke's father. And she stood up and says, ah, no. Jessica has an interpretation for her reaction, right? It's just blood, old blood at that. Don't be worried. Don't be skittish. Don't get all queasy about the fact that it's blood. Seems to be Jessica's implication. That certainly is how Mapes interprets her statement. Did you think the blood bothered me? I'm of the desert and I've seen blood aplenty, she says. So, why did Mapes stand up and say, ah now? 
I don't want to spend too much time on this because we don't know the answer. We can guess, and we can even maybe form some pretty plausible theories, especially if we base them on things that we come to learn about Fremen culture further on down the road throughout the rest of the book. But I think the more important point is, at this moment in the book, we have no idea why. There is an obvious reason, one obvious reason why somebody, especially, you know, a serving woman, right, would be like, oh, blood! Perfectly natural to think that it's squeamishness that she's responding. But, um, but we're immediately told nothing more than the fact that that's definitely not it. She's totally comfortable with blood and the shedding of blood. But, so what is her answer? What is her reason? What, again, we don't know. Um, not at this point. We have no way of knowing at this point, at page, page 90 in the Big Fat Edition of the book. We're 10% of the way through this book. We don't know. We have no way of knowing. But we are reminded in that moment that Mapes has a different grid, right? And that we don't know what that grid is. And again, I'm almost tempted to put this moment back against that earlier moment in the conversation, right? Again, you know, all of that, Jessica is the wise one who sees all and Mapes is really... No, Jessica is ignorant. The assumption she's making about Mapes are completely wrong. She doesn't understand Mapes. She thinks she's wrapping Mapes around her finger, right, with the whole panoplia propheticus thing that she's pulling on her, the sham that she's playing. But, uh, but she's not. Exactly. That's not, certainly not from Mape's perspective, what's happening. And maybe Jessica's grid is the one that's wrong. We don't know. But again, the way, I think that this is one of a bunch of moments in which, you know, I, uh, I said back at the beginning of the first class that one of the things I find so wonderful about this book is its incredibly rich suggestiveness. Um, th there are just volumes and volumes of untold stories that we get glimpses of. Um, you know, we know there are always plans within plans, as, uh, as Baron Harkonnen says. Um, there's always plans within plans in this story. There's always stuff going on beneath the surface. Somebody else always has a wider grid, right? Somebody always a different grid. Um, there are a bunch of moments um, in this story where we don't... We get a glimpse of something else that's never really explained, right? That we never really understand the truth of. One last uh, example of that here, actually, to sort of digress for a, for a second. Um, this is her talking to Yui. There will be much blood sh bloodshed soon, she said. The Harkonnens won't rest until they're dead or my duke destroyed. The Baron cannot forget that Leto is a cousin of the royal blood, no matter what the distance, while the Harkonnen titles come out, came out of the Chome pocketbook. But the poison in him, deep in his mind, is the knowledge that an Atreides had a Harkonnen banished for cowardice after the Battle of Corin. The old feud, Yui muttered and for a moment he felt an acid touch of hate. The old feud had trapped him in its web, killed his Juana, or worse, left her for Harkonnen tortures until her husband did their bidding. The old feud had trapped him, and these people were part of that poisonous thing. The irony was that such deadliness could come to flower here on Arrakis, the one source in the universe of Melange, the, the prolonger of life, the giver of health. What are you thinking? she asked. I'm thinking that the spice brings 620,000 solaris the decagram on the open market right now. That is wealth to buy many things. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, we get, of course, history here. Notice again, I, I don't know about you, but I don't believe her. I don't think she's quite right about this. Um, I don't think that the poison deep in the Baron's mind is the knowledge that an Atreides had a Harkonnen banished for cowardice after the Battle of Corin. Uh, maybe. Maybe. 
Baron Harkonnen is primarily motivated by ancestral dignity, right? They besmirched the honor of my house, and so therefore I'm... Mm -hmm. um, I'm not buying that. Um, are you buying that? I'm not buying that. Um, so again, that's one interesting thing that we can see here. Um, again, we, we, we are uh, in another moment in which I think we are led to see through, not see through, see around her grid. I'm trying to think of the right adverb there. But anyway, um, we see also Yue's little flash perspective here, right? Yeah, the Atreides are the good guys. Yeah, they're being trapped. Yes, they're being, you know, they're, they're, they're the ones who are being manipulated. But from Yui's outsider perspective here, they're part of the problem. Right, he feels a flash of hatred for them as well as for the Harkonnens. Of course, he hates the Harkonnens most because they're the ones who actually tortured and or killed uh, his wife. But it's... um. But it's not just, um, it's not just, it's not just that, right? Um, it, it's not just the Harkonnens that earn his ire. It's the Atreides also that earn his ire. This whole feud that's brought him in. Um, I love that. And then, you know, the, the, what he then introduces, the irony was that such deadliness should come to flower here on Arrakis, the one source in the universe of Melange, the prolonger of life, the giver of health. There's another one. Notice he just did the Demi Dickens again, right? You should think about the irony of all of these traps and death here on Arrakis, the source of melange. Discuss amongst yourselves, right? Not going to go any further than that. Just going to point that out, right? Um, and then I love his evasive answer. Um, but um, anyway, yeah, Michael... Cheskovsky says, the Atreides play the game and are therefore responsible. They've entered the bull ring, right? You can see Arrakis like the Gom Jabbar, as we were saying in the first case. It's like the pain box that you put your hand in on purpose and leave it there to submit to pain to show that you're human, right? Um, you know, to... Uh, endure the trap and seek to slay the trapper um, and thus remove a danger to your kind just like what Leto is doing in Arrakis but Arrakis is also kind of like the bull ring that his father entered into he's two men right one lovely and one less lovely um, yeah here's the first time and I'll bet that many of you are surprised that this is the first time I've gotten around to uh, talking about one of the epigrams at the beginning of the chapters. Um, it is said that the Duke Leto blinded himself to the perils of Arrakis, that he walked heedlessly into the pit. Would it not be more likely to suggest that he had lived so long in the presence of extreme danger uh, he misjudged a change in its intensity? Or is it possible he deliberately sacrificed himself, that his son might have a better life? All evidence indicates the Duke was a man not easily hoodwinked. Thus, quoth the Princess Irulan, who does a lot of quoting over the course of this book. Um, I do, of course, want to think about and talk about um, the, uh, uh, the, the chapter openings. Uh, to talk about the collected works of the Princess Irulan um, before the end of the semester. But that is not this day. We'll come back to that. Um, which was the Duke? Human or animal? Um, did he walk heedlessly into the pit? Was he foolish to do what he did? Was it foolish or brave? Um, was he deliberately sacrificing himself that his son might have a better life? Did he just misjudge the intensity of the danger? Um, these are interesting and I think important questions. Then look, um, here's the Duke's own 
point of view, in a sense, in the chapter which that quotation introduces. The Duke felt in this moment that his own dearest dream was to call was to end all class distinctions and never again think of deadly order. Okay, ancestral dignity. He looked up and out of the dust at the unwinking stars, thought, around one of those little lights circles Caledon, but I'll never again see my home. The longing for Caledon was a sudden pain in his breast. He felt that it did not come from within himself, but that it reached out to him from Caledon. He could not bring himself to call this dry wasteland of Arrakis his home, and he doubted he ever would. I must mask my feelings, he thought, for the boy's sake. If ever he's to have a home, this must be it. I may think of Arrakis as a hell I've reached before death, but he must find here that which will inspire him. There must be something. A wave of self-pity, immediately despised and rejected, swept through him, and for some reason he found himself recalling two lines from a poem Gurney Halleck often repeated. My lungs taste the air of time, blown past falling sands. Well, Gurney would find plenty of falling sands here, the Duke thought. The central wastelands beyond those moon-frosted cliffs were desert, barren rock, dunes, and blowing dust, an uncharted dry wilderness, with here and there along its rim and perhaps scattered through it, knots of Fremen. If anything could buy a future for the Atreides line, the Fremen just might do it. What do we see in the Duke's own thoughts here? You know, we've been looking at the Duke from the outside, thinking about, you know, we've got the, you know, the, 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 the portrait and the head, right? We've got Jessica's own feelings and her talking about him being divided. We have the Princess Irulan speaking of other people's, um, you know, speculations about um, whether the Duke was a fool or, or, or whether he was uh, noble and self-sacrificing. Um, what, um, what do we see here in the Duke's own perspective? Once again, we see, uh, as uh, we observed in the last class, once again, the point of view of the story keeps jumping around, right? And now we are inside the head of the Duke, and we're seeing what he's thinking. And what he's thinking, what's the answer to the question? Did he go there on purpose? Yeah, he went there on purpose. Yeah, he knew what he was getting into. Was he foolish? No, look, he, he thinks of Arrakis as a hell he's reached before death, right? Like he's already being, he's already dead and being punished, right? Kristen Huck says resignation. He's not blind to the danger. Um, also, this passage is full of foreshadowing, says Kristen. I absolutely agree. He's resigned. Um, for the father, nothing. He doesn't need to be told that. There's nothing for him here. He died when he left Caladan. Remember Thufar Hawat's comments, right? Are you sad to leave Caladan? Says Paul to Thufar. And he says, Oh no, you know, you, 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 it's just a place, right? Leaving people is sad, but a place is just a place. Not Toledo, right? It was his ancestral home. That was the place of the Atreides. And they've, he's left it behind. Why? So that Paul can build a life. Um, he must find here something that will inspire him. If he's ever to have a home, this must be it. He could not, the implication there, he could not have had Caladan as his home. Um, he had to come here. He couldn't have stayed. We know that. He had to either go rene renegade or, or go, but again, it's not like, oh, make a home somewhere else. That was Jessica's argument, right? Let's go renegade. Let's go outside the system and we'll make a home for ourselves somewhere else. Um, no, the only home he could possibly have will be here. There must be something. If anything could buy a future for the Atreides line, the Fremen just might do it. Um, my lungs taste the air of time blown past falling sands. Um, that image is really interesting, the image of the lungs tasting the air of time. You've got, of course, the falling sands recalling the hourglass, of course, and, uh, and, and the in inexorable passage of time, um, and the idea of your lungs 
tasting that, the air of time as it blows past. Um, it's an interesting image. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Carolyn says, the ancestral dignity doesn't look backwards to his father, but rather forward to Paul. Yeah, he is clearly making a sacrifice, and it's a sacrifice for Paul's sake. Um, whether that means he had some kind of prescient understanding of what was coming, uh, you know, I don't know, I doubt that myself. But, um, but in his mind, this is clearly a sacrifice for Paul's sake. Um, so, and that's a human thing, right? That brings us right back to, you know, Arrakis as Gom Jabbar, right? Um, and him putting his hand in the box and keeping it in the box. Him staying in the trap and seeking to kill the trapper. Um, and Megan Vance says, D, all of the above. Yeah, he's two men, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, good, good. Um, yeah. Um, one last... Um, one last passage, quick, and then I'll let you go. This is Paul's assessment of things at the end of the meeting. It ended up in confusion, Paul thought, staring at the backs of the last men to leave. Always before, staff had ended on an incisive air. This meeting had just seemed to trickle out, worn down by its own inadequacies, and with an argument to top it off. For the first time, Paul allowed himself to think about the real possibility of defeat, not thinking about it out of fear or because of warnings such as that of the Reverend of the old Reverend Mother, but facing up to it because of his own assessment of the situation. My father is desperate, he thought. Things aren't going well for us at all. And Hamat. Paul recalled how the old Mentat had acted during the conference. Subtle hesitations, signs of unrest. Hamat was deeply troubled by something. Um Yeah. We'll come back to how it. Um, I want to look at him more later. But um, my father is desperate, he says. Paul can see his father failing, right? He sees through. He, he has that moment where he says, that that's wrong. What he just did there, what he just decided, that's 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 going to backfire. That's the wrong thing to do. Okay, it's almost like his uh, sense for you know his instinct for rightness, right? That's that's he knows that that's not right. Um, Paul's grid is better than his dad's grid. He doesn't know everything that his dad knows, but Paul's grid is better than his dad's grid, right? Um, Lido is doing what he's doing for a good reason, right? He's sacrificing himself for Paul. That seems to me a fair way to characterize what we just saw from his own point of view. But, but he's also failing. He's not... Uh, he can't do what he's trying to do. Um, and he's not just going to be a victim. When he falls and his house collapses, it's going to be partially his own fault and due to their own inadequacies, their own miscalculations. Um, and Paul sees that. All these things, I think, are going to be really important later on. Looking at um, Leto's character, I think, is a really important thing in order to have in mind... Duke Leto is going to be such a prominent figure throughout this book, even after his death. Um, and so I thought it was really important, especially since we were given such a clear cue to look at this with the bull and the picture thing. Um, I wanted to look at Duke Leto's character to get to sort of build a vocabulary um, for talking about that and for understanding the impact that Duke Leto uh, and the ideas or the concept of Duke Leto is going to be having on Paul uh, later on in the story. Well, I will let you guys go now, um, but, uh, you know, next time we will uh, 
things will things will start to get real ugly next time. But anyway, uh, thanks very much for joining me, everybody, and I will see you guys next Wednesday night. Good night now. <laughs>